Hello, young people of the internet. It is Rachel with the Bill of Rights Institute, and I'm here with my colleagues, Gary and Kirk. So let's start with just check-ins. Kirk, how you doing? Doing, doing pretty good, all things considered. I think, I think I'm starting to get a little bit more adjusted, but things are certainly still odd, that's for sure. Yeah, how about you, Gary? Yeah, no, things are definitely strange, but they're getting less strange. It's like what they say about a new normal, right? You can kind of get used to anything, but I'm finding that, you know, I'm really getting to know my home and kind of near vicinity really well. I feel the same way. Um, I I did have to say that when, when is it Governor Northrop came down with June 10th as the date right. that Virginia will open, there was a, there was a new reality because that's a long time away. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, but I think I think I agree that I, I'm starting well, at least in my neighborhood. So I live in Washington, DC. And in my neighborhood, I've there are a lot more people kind of out and about that I'm starting to get to know, like neighbors that I've just never really seen because our schedules never overlapped. Right. So yeah. I, yeah. I think it's been interesting for me just observing how people around me are are dealing with with everything, whether it's uh, you know, people out walking their dogs. I'm, no I'm noticing the same people when I go out in the morning or the afternoon, um, or even talking to, to colleagues or other folks that we're working with, um, you know, starting to notice some commonalities and some differences just in how people are, are responding to this, this, you know, really unprecedented situation. Yeah, I'm experiencing that too. It's funny because it, just because I'm seeing neighbors, I'm not interacting with them, but it kind of doesn't matter. I feel like I'm still through like seeing them visually every day, you know, and sometimes hearing music and things. I, I'm learning a lot of details about the people that I'm not actually directly interacting with in any way. And I feel like I know them better. And at some point, I feel like I can almost approach them, you know, and, and say, hey, I've seen your, your big red dog every day. I'd <laughs> love to give it a pet. I, I also think I've not I'm like noticing things about my home that I didn't notice before. Like, I wonder how many like home improvement projects are being done. <laughs> Cause right. you know, I just never paid attention to like that particular paint color, or the way that the way that this room is arranged. Um, right. and I, so I'm not only noticing things outside, but also the things that are really close to me um, as well. So, it, and that's actually what we want to talk to you all today about. So we've been noticing lots of things and, and feeling like, our observational tentacles are really wired. Um, and we want to talk to you a little bit about observation and, and some of the most famous observers and what they had to say throughout history so that you, as you're going through your days and, and weeks um, in this environment, whatever environment you find yourself, you have some techniques and some, some strategies to think about how to observe um, historically and philosophically and internally and externally uh, to help you pass, pass the time as, as you young people go through your lives um, in, this, in the next couple of weeks. So to start, we wanted to start with an author very dear to me and Kirk's heart. Um, his name is Adam Smith. And he has quite a few things to talk to say about observation. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, Adam Smith was was absolutely uh, at his core an observer, um, and I think that that is something that really set him apart. He was a part of um, something called the Scottish Enlightenment, um, and there's a bunch of philosophers um, associated with that: David Hume, um, Francis Hutcheson, among others. Um, but Smith. Um, and as I'm observing the light changing in my room, um, Smith was very much uh, a person who would, who would look out his window and observe how it is that people interacted with one another. Um, so, you know, things Rachel and Gary and I were just talking about are sort of um, what we kind of formally call civil society, but we call it that when we're observing it, right? When we're just living our lives, we call it interacting with one another or things I saw. Um, but Smith, spent a lot of time thinking about these things. Um, and his book he's most famous for um, is often referred to as The Wealth of Nations, um, but it's actually, uh, the full title is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, right? So even there you can see he's not just looking at how it is that, you know, things are behaving, but he's looking at the nature of them. So what makes them up? Why is it that some nations have a lot of goods and other nations have less goods? What is it that really sets them apart um, and, and what lessons can we take from that? 
Um, another famous book uh, that he wrote is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, right? That seems odd. We think of Smith as an economist, and now he's talking about moral sentiments. Um, but moral sentiments are really what, what, what he saw as how it is that we come up with the things that we believe in, what it is that we think, um, and, and what it is that, that we are concerned about, and how it is that those motivations um, affect us. And the first sentence of the book, I think, is is really interesting look into what Smith's project is. It says, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Right? So he's saying, look, we're all intrinsically motivated, meaning we all do things because it's in our own direct interest, typically. But for some reason, we really care about other people and how those people act and behave and, 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 and go about their lives affects us. And not only does it affect us, but we're actually interested in that in some way, right? And that's very much at the heart of observing, right? And so he's asking this question of why is there this inherent contradiction? Um, and he goes and starts to talk about two proximity. And he has another famous example um, in this text where he talks about how our immediate experience, which we're all going through right now, um, becomes much larger than the experience of people who are further away from us. And so he gives this example of an earthquake. And he says, you know, if there's an earthquake um, on the other side of the world, you would think less about that earthquake than you would if you were to stub your toe. Or he uses the example of cut off your finger, right? If you cut off your finger, that would become immediately, um, immediately big. And now we're going to observe my dog coming and saying hello. <laughs> um, and my dog being here is now the immediate thing that I'm dealing with. Um, and yet, uh, and yet the uh, thinking about the, but the earthquake becomes secondary, right? Um, so this is something that I'm immediately dealing with. And so what we're observing, what's immediately in front of us uh, becomes our experience in total. Um, and, and dealing with that, you know, there's implications from that. And there's things that we need to be aware of because of that. And there's things that we need to, um, to work to be educated to, to make sure that we're not totally absorbed by that too. Um, and Smith uses that example um, to say, look, you know, it, it's, it's frightening that we don't think about all these people that are being affected on, in a faraway place. Um, but it's also something that we should be, um, that, that, that is just a part of our, our nature. So I think, I think that's actually really interesting. Something I want to talk to you all about out there on the internet. Is what, what, is, what are you observing about your own experience of what matters right now? Like, have you noticed that you've gone more micro and that you're caring more about what's happening to your neighbors in your community? Or are you going more macro and you've started paying attention to things way outside yourself um, and, and things that you had not really paid attention to before? So what is, what is close to you right now? What's the equivalent of your finger versus what's really far away right now? What's the equivalent of the earthquake on the other side of the world for you? Um, and so Gary taught, psychology for for a long time and so he actually used to do a lot of observations with his students so Gary why don't you talk about like like the theories of observation and how we can kind of put them into structures yeah no absolutely you know when when Kirk was talking about that teaching history and teaching psychology you know sometimes they overlapped a lot and that same concept you were just talking about um, with Adam Smith um, is, is what we talk about in psychology is the law of proximity you mentioned it before right that there's there's what is immediate in terms of time and geographic distance, right? So what's immediate to me right now in my circle is I'm going to feel more strongly, good or bad, about that than I am about something that is a few miles away, happened a long time ago. You know, the farther away in distance and time by the law of proximity, just the less emotional impact it has. Um, but at the same time, that can shift because of the way things are going on. You know, you can connect now geographically or through time. I'm, I'm finding I'm reading a lot more this old National Geographics um, from a long time ago, you know, to find, to connect to things that happened in the past or connect to things that aren't far away from now. And it's funny, if you've been watching this series, both looking at art and journaling, both kind of put into this a little bit. Instead of looking at art, though, I like to encourage students to be home historians, right? So you can, the, the activities that we would do is say, can you be an observer with some kind of structure, just like you were saying? Um, 
it does in a way, uh, uh, oh goodness, I'm going so fast. <laughs> it does in a way require some kind of structure, right? So in psychology, we call this naturalistic observation. And it, it often is associated with nature itself, but can be just what is in the setting around you, what's in the natural just world happening. You're not, you're not changing it, you're not doing an experiment, you're just seeing what's happening. You might be a participant, right? You might directly interact with somebody because it is your world that you're observing, but you might also be a non-participant, the big red dog I keep talking about. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not participating with that dog, but it's interesting to observe and to really pay attention. And so what I encourage you to do at home, if you are still journaling, is to start incorporating some naturalistic observation. You might wanna sample something like an event. Is there an event that happens regularly or uh, happens frequently enough that is piquing your interest? You might look at a time period and journal down what's happening from point A to point B in time, everything you can observe. For this part, I often think about one of my favorite that I read a lot, which is Sherlock Holmes, right? And um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's series is a really good one to catch up on right now. But it's an interesting thing in terms of training your brain to observe things. All right, here's a quick example. I'm gonna pose this one to Kirk. Kirk, what was on my mug I've been drinking from all this whole time? I think it was a cupcake. Oh my goodness, you're so good, it was a cupcake. <laughs> How about this one, Rachel? What was the topic of the magazine I'm reading? The Arctic. Oh my goodness, you guys are very, very good. How did you do that? Well, I, I, so there is something that I notice about my own observations. I read everything. So anytime there are words on the screen, I like to read them. So I immediately was like, what is this topic? And, and I looked and it was the Arctic. That's good. So yeah, at home, start thinking about what are you paying more attention to? And what are others paying attention to you as well? And, and I, I encourage recording it. Now, there's one thing I do want to end with, which is there's an ethical part of this, right? These are human beings if you're talking about other human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not saying do an experiment on somebody or trick somebody or be really creepy and hide out somewhere observing somebody. What we're saying is just use the senses that are there and be more aware. And maybe this is happening. You know, maybe the world outside our cell phones and our computers, we're starting to pay attention a little bit more to things. And some of that really is important. And so one person you were mentioning philosophers before, this is a French philosopher that I encourage you, he's, he's somebody you can read, it's Jean-Paul Sartre. He talks about the look, this idea that proximity really is about yourself as a subject. You are the only subject in your world. Everything else is an object in your world, but not really everything else because we understand other people are their own subjects and they are observing. So how we observe each other, he calls this look, this idea that I am seeing you as an object in my world, but you are seeing me as an object in your world. And what does that mean ethically? And it's, what does that mean for who we are and how we interact? And I think it's something you should contemplate in your journal. In your journal or in conversation with others. Um, one of the things that we, we, we are all doing more, I think, is, is reaching out and communicating with, with one another and, and being in touch. There's this idea of the other and the individual is, is a really interesting one that a lot of philosophers have actually struggled with. A lot of um, historians, naturalistic philosophers have, have asked questions about what is the nature of my relationship to the other? How do I form relationships? Um, and I'm gonna circle back around to Kirk because Smith in his theory of moral sentiments, the reason he wrote that um, is because he, he was trying to understand how we form the sentiments that we do about one another. Why do I think about you, Gary, the way I think about you, about my mother, the way I think about my mother, about you know those in New York City, the way I think about those in New York City? Um, so Kirk, you want to talk to us a little bit about the moral sentiments? Sure, yeah. So so Smith, uh, again, Smith the observer, he's looking at the world around him and trying to figure out why things happen the way they happen, right? Um, and the way that he did that for figuring out how it is that we believe and think um, was to think about something he called the impartial spectator. So he says all of us have this impartial spectator within us. Um, and so this is an imaginary um, uh, sort of a thought experiment uh, where he's saying um, we judge ourselves based off how we think we ought to be judged. Um, in, in other words, 
Um, we want people to like us for the reasons we want them to like us. Um, and we want people to respect us for the reason we want for the reasons that we want to be respected. Um, so it's our own projection out into the world. Um, and, and through uh, the, the entire work, he's sort of wrestling with, with this and, and, and how it is that that informs why it is we believe certain things. And, and ultimately, he says, you know, the, the place we want to be is, is respected for being sort of this um, virtuous and, and uh, well uh, meaning and intention individual um, who is working on behalf of others, but doing so intrinsically, not doing so because we're benefiting in some way. Right. Um, and, and that's kind of his, his way of, of observing the world, which, um, which, which, is, which is interesting uh, because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people that wrestle with Smith um, and the fact that he was wrestling with sort of this, this core idea of what it means to be self-interested, um, I think adds some, some interesting depth to, to his project. Absolutely. And so that idea of the impartial spectator, that there is some, some, something that we are putting our mind towards outside of the self that would judge us is something that I, I mean, I think teenagers feel all the time, right? Like you have a natural spectator who is, you're constantly thinking about what other people are thinking about you or your own behavior. And so part of that, part of what that does is that helps you analyze your own behavior and and sometimes that can be really healthy and sometimes that's not so healthy uh, yeah go can ahead. i say another yeah. plug for psychology in psychology that's called the spotlight effect if you yep. are recording this at home this <laughs> idea that everyone thinks they are in the spotlight and everything they're doing is being observed and yet we all think it so we all can't be in the spotlight at the same time but psychologically that's what it is exactly that's absolutely exactly right yeah. And so while we're all, while we all want to know what makes our observations unique and special, a lot of people who have, who have observed American culture have recognized unique and special things about American culture. The one that's most famous is a, a, um, a, a theorist, he was actually a, a kind of historian, I guess, um, named Alexis de Tocqueville. And, and he wrote, the most famous book he wrote was Democracy in America. And so he was, he was here in the United States to actually observe in the 1830s about the American prison system. But as he was traveling the country, he was noticing all these things about American culture that were unique and different from the French culture and from the arist aristocratic cultures that he came from. The thing that he noticed most was this idea of the associations that Americans form. So they, Americans, as we can see right now, come together in these amazing ways. And that's actually really unique in culture. So, and he recognized, so I'm just gonna read this aloud to you. The inhabitant of the United States learns from birth that he must depend on himself in the struggle against the ills and difficulties of life. He looks upon social authority only with a defiant and uneasy eye and calls upon the power only when he cannot do without it. This begins to be noticed as early as school, where children, even in their games, submit to their own rules and punish their own infractions. The same spirit is found in all the actions of social life. An obstruction occurs on the public road, the way is interrupted, traffic stops, the neighbors soon get together as a deliberative body. Out of this improvised assembly will come an executive power that will remedy the difficulty before the idea of an authority predating that of those interested has occurred to anyone's imagination. So I'm sure you've seen examples of that right now. Think about something in your community that people needed. Was it masks? Was it food delivery? Was it, oh, what are some other great examples? Um, you know, uh, anything? Oh, go water, ahead. groceries, water, supplies. Water, groceries. Fostering teaching. puppies and kittens. Fostering, Fostering puppies, puppies and, kittens. and kittens. I mean, so, and no one looked to the authority, looked to the, I mean, in, Obviously, governments need to support these activities, but in the immediate, almost everyone was like, what can I do as an individual? And that's a unique characteristic in the United States. And one we, one we should honor and support and recognize and observe. And so he, he finishes this sentence by saying, or this, this paragraph by saying, in the United States, Americans associate for purposes of public security, for commerce, for industry, for pleasure, for morality, for religion, there is nothing that human will despairs of achieving by the free action of the collective power of individuals. And so that's our exhortation for this episode of Bright and Early. 
is what is your power as an individual? How you can access that power is by observing your communities really closely, recognizing needs, recognizing trends, and then taking agency and action to support those around you. Kirk, Gary, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we close? No, I would love to hear about these things. I mean, we've talked about a nice connection of, of what you see, but in what you were just talking about here with the Tocqueville, the, they're seeing and then there's sort of a drive that happens sometimes from what you're seeing. And if what you're seeing can use your input, your action, there is that interesting drive that's, that's possible. So we'd yeah, love to hear about those things. Yeah, absolutely. And we'd love to we'd love to hear from you all uh, what you're what you're observing, what you're thinking about in your own communities. Um, and, and two, just to go back, um, journaling about some of these things can be really important too. You know, because when you when when we get beyond this, and, and someday we will be beyond it, um, looking back on these observations can be a really good lesson too. Um, you know, I'm sitting here looking at my cracked and dried hands uh, because I've been washing my hands a lot um, because of everything going on and. and and I know that that might be something that fades away, but but remembering back even to those minute details of what this experience is like uh, can really bring forth a lot of lessons and a lot of um, appreciation for when we get beyond these things and appreciation for the people in our communities who are supporting us and, and helping us um, to, to get through these challenging times and all those that are um, that are working hard to think of our healthcare workers, all these folks that are that are working on our behalf, um, but even simple folks out in the, I say simple, I mean just plain ordinary people out in our communities um, who are doing things like making sure that street lights and street lamps are working, um, observing these things, taking taking stock of it, and journaling about it, writing down. There, there's just a wealth of, of knowledge and information that can come from that. Right, that's what being a historian's about. Thank goodness we have what these people wrote. Exactly. All <laughs> the people behind me. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for your time and for your energy. Um, and remember that every individual one of you has a power to make a change in your community. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Bright and Early. Bye.